Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ninth week of our series on preventing and managing COVID-19 in the workplace. This is Karen O'Hara, Director of Marketing and Communications with WorkCare. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we appreciate your participation. And those of you who've joined us every week, welcome back. As you know, we record this session and then we distribute the recording via our YouTube channel by tomorrow. And we also summarize the questions and answers in writing and post them on our website. During the webinar, we will post the links to those uh, assets. During the webinar, please submit your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Our speaker today and every week is Dr. Anthony Harris, a board-certified occupational medicine physician. Dr. Harris is WorkCare's Vice President for On-Site Clinical Operations and an Associate Medical Director. He's also leading our COVID-19 clinical response. So in the interest of time, I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. And thanks, everyone, for joining us again. And uh, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and jump right into the presentation for today. Uh, because today, we're going to spend time talking about uh, how to deal with uh, the workforce in regards to asymptomatic uh, individuals. And obviously, uh, you've heard of asymptomatic people uh, before in terms of COVID-19. Uh, and so we're going to get into the weeds a little bit today uh, with some meaningful updates as regard in regards to how to um, put in a strategy together that helps uh, identify these individuals. And hopefully, um, the, the goal, obviously, is to get them uh, safe at home and quarantined and uh, not uh, transmitting the illness. And so for clinical updates, uh, we'll jump right in in terms of uh, not having any new um, presentations for uh, to this week in regards to clinical uh, happenings, if you would. Uh, obviously, we're, we'll uh, continue to watch the landscape and see uh, what new uh, findings uh, are being presented in the literature. Um, but for today, again, the focus is really going to be what do we do with the workforce that seems healthy um, and are asymptomatic throughout their entire infectious period uh, of COVID-19 because we're seeing it uh, in quite a, a fair amount of numbers. And so when we talk about symptoms uh, and we look at the literature, we've uh, shown this, uh, not the same graphic, but a similar graphic. This is an update of that in terms of what people are presenting with when they're hospitalized. And uh, clearly you can see all the classic presentations, the nausea, the vomiting, diarrhea, um, obviously the fever and cough, uh, sore throat. Uh, and, and in particular, um, what we want to point out is that these are symptoms we're seeing Yes, but when we talk about the um, uh, almost half of the population, they have none of these symptoms. And those are where we're going to focus in on in terms of asymptomatic uh, carriers. And if we look at, um, in particular now, those uh, individuals that are hospitalized, this is germane to uh, the amount of virus that's shed and continues to be shed uh, by individuals that uh, are, are uh, contracting COVID-19 and even uh, recovering, right? And so when, when we look at this particular uh, body of data, the uh, mean or average uh, for uh, uh, an individual who has been symptomatic, has been hospitalized to have um, uh, virus shedding, meaning that if you do a swab uh, or if you do a uh, culture of the fecal uh, uh, output, you can find uh, the RNA, the virus itself, or culture of the virus itself. And the mean for that uh, um, is 16.7 days after onset of symptoms. So you contract COVID-19 within one to two days, up to three days, you start to uh, have symptoms. Uh, and then you uh, are definitely infectious at that point and shedding virus, but that can be uh, up to 16 days of, uh, of the entire period that you're uh, able to transmit the illness. The duration in terms of, and that's from the respiratory droplets, right? That's what we're wearing the masks for, the cloth mask, trying to protect others uh, from uh, shedding the virus uh, in those droplets. Uh, if we look at the fecal matter though, it, it, the virus is shed for longer. Uh, and 27.9 days is the mean there. If we look at then, um, particularly individuals who uh, have uh, re recovered. Uh, they don't have any uh, more virus that's identifiable from the respiratory tract itself, 
um, we can still find uh, viral particles uh, that are infectious in nature in the fecal matter up to 11.2 days after a negative uh, swab of the uh, of mucosa of the respiratory tract. And uh, in, in, in some cases, 33 days after a negative uh, respiratory sample, people are still shedding the virus uh, in, in their fecal uh, matter. And so that is important because again, fecal oral is something we touched on briefly before, uh, and it is a route for infectiousness. Uh, and with these long durations of shedding the virus, we have to pay attention and come up with strategies again um, to deal with it that uh, are akin to uh, the uh, asymptomatic individuals as well. So if we look at uh, some uh, uh, studies, and this is actually a case study, uh, a letter that was published uh, in this uh, particular journal, uh, of, a journal of infection. Um, th this is a uh, story of a young lady, uh, 50, 50 years old, who was, uh, uh, had moderate, mild uh, symptoms, was hospitalized for a period of time, um, but uh, pointing this out because she was found to shed the virus uh, 63 days after onset of symptoms. And this is not an isolated um, uh, case, right? We're seeing more and more of these cases come to light uh, where people are shedding the virus for prolonged periods of time, even after they've recovered uh, and, and they're asymptomatic. And so when we talk about clinical picture, that's very important. If we look at then uh, the um, biology uh, and pathology piece of what we want to talk about today, we're just going to briefly recap uh, two points, the antigenic drift, the antigenic shift, uh, and these are mutations of the virus. Last week we talked about this, uh, and I'm bringing it up again today because it's important in uh, identifying again those individuals who uh, are, are going to likely be um, uh, shedders, right, and they're going to be shedding the virus that has mutated, which will affect our ability to treat potentially with, with uh, vaccines. And so this uh, I'm bringing up again because we're going to talk a little bit about vaccinations uh, as an approach to obviously treating those asymptomatic individuals. And as we look at the epidemiology, uh, we'll quickly update here in terms of burden of disease in the U.S. Uh, total uh, cases as of last week, again, was 1.1 million, almost 1.2 million. Uh, and we've gone up uh, upwards of close to 200,000 cases uh, since then this week to 1.34 million. Uh, and we're continuing to climb in terms of, you know, the absolute number. This was uh, last week, and if we look at this week, total number of deaths in the U.S., uh, we're, we're over 80,000, right? Uh, and so, again, these are numbers that we continue to pay attention to. If we look at this number from a death per million, um, we see a continual darkening uh, of the uh, population, not just in the U.S., but abroad, uh, in terms of uh, the death toll uh, from, from this pandemic. If we look at, uh, and this is an important one, uh, when we talk about addressing the asymptomatic population, uh, we are continuing to look at the number of tests per thousand individuals in the U.S. in particular, uh, in comparison to other countries. Uh, and, and we were number two, right, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, last week, we dropped to number five. Uh, in terms of number of tests per thousand. And this week we're still in that uh, fifth or starting to edge back into a fourth position here. Uh, in, in particular, New Zealand has done really well at curbing uh, and, and getting rid of uh, COVID-19. They had very early lockdown uh, of their um, entire country uh, and uh, they were able to curb and then test appropriately to make sure that uh, as they reopened, uh, they, they uh, didn't have a bump. Uh, in terms of resurgence of, of illness. If we look at then uh, the number of uh, daily tests uh, per thousand individuals, um, we uh, last week looked at this number, we were at about 0.7 um, per thousand individuals. This week we've improved that a little bit. Uh, we're, we're hanging out around uh, a little bit over one, so like 1.25 approximately tests per thousand individuals. And again, it's important to track this number because uh, testing is going to be uh, across the board a means to identify asymptomatic uh, individuals and carriers. If we look at then the number of cases uh, to uh, the, the number of tests that we need to, to detect a case 
uh, of COVID-19. Uh, we've gone from 6.3 uh, previously to now uh, 7. So we're, we're starting to move uh, in, in a slightly positive direction in terms of uh, the prevalence perhaps decreasing uh, in the U.S. in terms from an incident, excuse me, uh, of, the, uh, of illness uh, based upon the number of tests that we're conducting. If we look at the curve of uh, COVID as we have in, in recent uh, weeks, how rapidly are we increasing uh, the number of COVID cases? Uh, and this curve is important uh, from a classic epidemiology S curve again. Uh, that curve is continuing to flatten uh, as we look at it from two weeks ago to last week uh, to this week. Uh, and so we can uh, uh, surely see the uh, continual curve flattening as we do when we look at it also from the daily deaths uh, from COVID-19 in the U.S. This curve also is starting to have a negative slope, which is obviously positive in terms of our uh, getting, getting through um, uh, some tough periods uh, in terms of burden of disease. So in, in regards to uh, some key elements that we wanna make sure we're touching on uh, to uh, describe, uh, begin to describe the asymptomatic population, uh, you've probably heard uh, some uh, language or uh, terminology used. And, and we wanna kind of address those, if not debunk a little bit. Um, one of them is herd immunity, right? Uh, the, some are saying uh, that uh, eventually we'll have herd immunity and, and eventually meaning uh, soon this year, right? Uh, herd immunity is specifically, we have enough people in the uh, population um, that uh, have uh, contracted the, the illness and now uh, presumably are immune because of their immune response uh, to help protect those who have not yet uh, encountered COVID-19. And certainly we see this with other illnesses, with measles and um, uh, pertussis uh, and, and, and uh, uh, certainly smallpox and other illnesses, right? Um, but uh, to debunk that the notion that we're gonna have herd immunity uh, anytime soon is certainly what we wanna address uh, because at this point, uh, the inverse is true. The uh, incidence or prevalence of uh, COVID-19 right now is hovering around one to 2% in the US, right? Uh, and in order to have herd immunity as uh, in comparison to, let's say the measles, right? The measles has 96% immunity in the population. Um, and that's because of vaccination. If we look at pertussis, we're, we're talking 90%. Uh, uh, have been uh, vaccinated and are immune uh, to the illness, to, to pertussis in particular. That's the, the, those are the levels that are necessary to achieve that herd immunity. And obviously we're, we're nowhere close to that and we're not gonna get there until we have a vaccine because otherwise we, we, would, we would see a tremendous amount of mortality in the US in order to get close to these type of numbers. In terms of return to work, we'll mention this in regards to uh, a strategy for dealing with asymptomatic individuals. Uh, let's look at Wuhan and what they did and they, they staggered their workforce return. And we've mentioned that before in the past uh, and it is a uh, particularly effective means uh, to limit the transmission of the illness from asymptomatic individuals because uh, you're limiting the crowds, right? And whether that's staggered from an approach of phases of returning to work or even a permanency to um, uh, scheduled work, right? Uh, from shift work, uh, if you would. Um, th those are all tactics that have been used to help limit uh, transmission after um, the doors have been reopened for the economy. Uh, and then vaccination obviously is gonna be key for us in regards to producing the amount of immunity necessary to keep us all safe long term. Uh, and so we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what does that look like and uh, when, can, when can we expect that to come to bear. Uh, it, it, right now we're talking about an accelerated pathway for vaccination uh, to hit the market, for a vaccine to hit the market. And that's, that accelerated path is 12 to 18 months. Uh, if we look at the different stages uh, from a clinical trial standpoint, um, there are different phases, uh, preclinical, phase one, two, and three, and then there's an FDA review, and then what's called phase four, uh, and each of these are increasing number of participants in order to uh, kind of pass the toll gate between one phase to the next phase. Uh, and so you can see here a small number, 20 to 80 for phase one, uh, going up to the hundreds for phase two, and then uh, two to, you know, one to 3,000 for phase three, uh, and well over, uh, a thousand patients, even 4,000, 5,000 patients uh, in phase four. And that's after a drug has been approved and it's starting to be used in the population that we uh, look at phase four data. And to look at it another way in terms of what happens in each phase of clinical approval, 
uh, if, first, if we look at the, the amount of time um, that uh, has historically been applied to this process, we're, we're talking five to 15 years. And so certainly when we say accelerated process, uh, 12 to 18 months is a drastic acceleration of this process. Um, in the preclinical, we're looking mainly at uh, an early exploration of, is a, uh, a vaccine going to work? Is a drug going to work? Phase one then goes into looking at the safety uh, of that particular uh, in, uh, intervention. Phase two looks at the effectiveness, and then three looks at also the safety and the effectiveness compared to other treatments that may be available. Obviously, in this case, there are no approved treatments as of yet uh, to make those comparisons, and we'll see how that plays out in terms of pipeline. Uh, then the FDA review and the phase four uh, are pretty straightforward in regards to after approval and then looking at the performance of the um, vaccine after approval in that phase four. So if we look at then what the pipeline is like to give us some type of indication of how we can control asymptomatic population with vaccination being a solution, uh, right now in the pipeline, as of last week, there's only one medication identified in that phase two to phase three uh, period of approval. Uh, and in this particular case, it's BCG. BCG is something that you may be familiar with, uh, having been used uh, to help boost the immune system towards immunity of other uh, illnesses like tuberculosis. And so this is under study um, currently to see if it's uh, going to be efficacious for uh, fighting COVID-19 uh, being conducted uh, abroad here um, over, uh, over in uh, uh, Melbourne. Uh, so when we talk about the next phase, the phase, the truly uh, number of uh, in, uh, um, potentials in phase two, there's only two of them identified right now. Um, and those uh, are, again, uh, are in that phase of exploring beyond, you know, uh, preclinical, beyond the uh, looking at safety and looking at now efficaciousness, right? Uh, and so, or excuse me, a, a safety at this point uh, versus efficaciousness. And so we, we want to, uh, you know, continue to watch these two medications to see how they progress. If we look then at phase one, the pipeline grows obviously a little broader um, with a number of five uh, uh, identified uh, potentials in that category. And then in preclinicals, we're talking 10, right? Uh, 10 in the pipeline for preclinicals. And then early research, a greater number, 26. So the, the, um, you know, some, some are saying that uh, the early research numbers are, are, are 100 or greater uh, of uh, pipeline uh, potentials. But again, these are uh, confirmed uh, uh, studies that are currently underway uh, that have uh, a trajectory of going through uh, continued uh, approval uh, through that pipe, uh, that pipeway, or that uh, excuse me, pipeline I showed you earlier. If we look then uh, beyond vaccination, right, and, and we look to other controls um, that we can conduct uh, in the workplace. Uh, we obviously have talked about a number of controls in regards to, um, you know, the good hygiene, the social distancing, and we won't, uh, we won't skip over that this time, right? Those are going to be tried and true ways to help control asymptomatic individuals in the workplace. The social distancing, the pre-screening uh, will identify those symptomatic, obviously not effective for asymptomatic individuals. However, um, the pre-screen portion that are, uh, that is going to be effective is our questions related to contacts, right? Uh, and when we talk about contact tracing, um, that also will play a key role in identifying individuals who may be asymptomatic carriers of COVID-19. And so it, it's not to say um, pre-screening uh, shouldn't be done or performed at whatsoever if you're worried about asymptomatic population. No, the questions then will be effective uh, for a, a contact tracing perspective to, to identify potentials uh, in, in, in the asymptomatic category. Um, the regular monitoring, obviously, is good for um, those individuals that will become ill or uh, uh, develop fever. Uh, and then obviously the, the personal protective equipment, having the masks on, are going to be key uh, uh, to helping uh, stem the tide of transmission for those particular asymptomatic individuals, right? And that's the whole uh, push right now for the cloth uh, coverings because it protects others from you, the individual wearing the mask, uh, if you happen to be one of these asymptomatic persons uh, that are, are not aware they're, they're carrying, uh, uh, carrying uh, COVID-19. 
And so when we drill down then in terms of what the landscape looks like beyond, you know, those interventions that are personal protective and screening, uh, looking at a testing regimen, it's also going to be germane to uh, protecting our workforce from asymptomatic carriers. Uh, we mentioned the genetic shift and genetic drift earlier because um, uh, we'll see uh, some impact uh, as we look at testing effectiveness, sensitivity, and specificity. Um, but mainly when we talk about testing uh, and looking at uh, statistics on asymptomatic individuals, there are several studies out that are uh, showing numbers that uh, have a pretty broad um, uh, range of of asymptomatic uh, um, uh, estimates. Um, on the Diamond Princess cruise, 18% of the individuals were asymptomatic. Uh, if we look at uh, comparisons uh, from MERS, uh, the numbers go up to almost 30%, 29%, 0 to 29%. Uh, if we look at uh, data out of Wuhan um, and WHO, uh, some of that WHO data is uh, suggesting that 80% of, of people uh, infectious uh, are, are, are um, having mild or asymptomatic uh, presentations. And so these numbers obviously are, are, are broad. Um, the Iceland study, some um, of you have, may have heard of, 50% uh, of people uh, had no symptoms that were tested uh, and were positive for COVID-19. And so it poses obviously a continual um, uh, conundrum of how do we deal with this in an effective way? How do we begin to estimate what the impact to our, uh, to our employers are gonna be, is gonna be from, from these asymptomatic carriers? And, and do, we, do we ever see an end to it, obviously? And the answer is yes. Uh, once we have a vaccine, uh, there will be uh, an, an end, so to speak, to the level of uh, uh, fortitude we have to have for testing and screening. Um, but what we're doing at, at WorkCare in particular is starting to help estimate for our clients um, what that picture looks like for impacting their particular geographic locations um, and, and the burden of illness uh, thereof. And so we're uh, collecting data from num numerous sources, uh, John Hopkins University being one of them, and we're able to look at then uh, uh, um, a state and county specific data. And from that specific data, we can look at the, um, uh, both the incidence and the prevalence of illness. Uh, and because of that uh, level of burden, uh, we can then uh, approximate uh, before we start testing, as we begin to start testing, what we expect to see on the other side of those tests. And so in this case, uh, we looked at Iowa, uh, Wapello, Iowa, the county, uh, and they had confirmed uh, uh, an estimate of uh, 259 cases, which if you look at it from a, uh, a base of 100,000 in the population, um, that's about seven, uh, 700 735, 735.6. Uh, and that gives us an estimate of about one to two to three point, uh, excuse me, 1.8 to 3.7 percent, um, uh, if we went out and tested, uh, would be positive potentially um, for this particular workforce. Uh, if we look at another county, in this case, New Jersey, Mil um, uh, Middlesex, New Jersey, uh, 1691 are the, uh, is the rate of confirmed cases per thousand population, 14,000 cases in total. Uh, again, this these are numbers current as of uh, May 8th, and that would give us an estimate of 4.2 to 8 percent of the population potentially positive if we went out and started testing the workforce, right? And so given these numbers, that will help us formulate our strategy uh, for where to focus resources uh, and when we talk about constraints around testing volume and things of that nature, um, and it helps us develop the process by which we can continue to do surveillance. And so uh, we showed uh, glimpses of this and have gone over in more depth uh, in terms of the program we put in place, but focusing in on uh, the last two uh, rings of this cycle or of surveillance, um, the risk appraisal and the scheduled testing uh, are important uh, for geographic determinants of risk, right? Uh, and then on top of that, the social determinants of risk uh, will play a key role, uh, just as I was showing you previously uh, on the previous slides there in terms of burden of disease and then risk of contracting uh, COVID-19. And in fact, we are doing this now, right? Uh, we are delivering um, uh, testing uh, to different sites across the US. Uh, and we're starting to see numbers come in uh, based upon these levels of burden. Texas, some areas, uh, particularly particular industries, have been hit uh, quite hard. 60% of people tested uh, were positive, and many of those, uh, up to 25 to 30%, asymptomatic. One gentleman I spoke with uh, anecdotally uh, said, yeah, I had a cough for about 24 hours, uh, and then I felt fine. 
And he, when he was positive for his uh, a swab of COVID-19, looking at the antigen, uh, his cough was three weeks prior to him being positive uh, uh, with his test. Right, and so um, therein lies again uh, the uh, a continuum of shedding a virus that we're seeing across the board, uh, and why we have to have some type of surveillance program in place uh, to help mitigate risk uh, of transmission in the workplace. And, and again, uh, these are things that we're starting to deliver uh, as the rubber meets the road with regard to gearing up for testing. Uh, and we'll continue it, right? Uh, as uh, the nation continues to open its doors and get the workforce back uh, to work, we want to make sure we're doing that safely. I presented these um, uh, particular bullet points that uh, Governor Cuomo in New York uh, gave as a uh, line item of criteria that need to be met for certain geographics within the state of New York to reopen, right? Uh, and so we'll, we'll pay attention to these and then we'll help uh, our, our partners uh, as they strategize their uh, uh, um, reopening and make sure that we're doing as much as we can uh, to keep the workforce safe. Uh, so I'll stop there. We'll go ahead and open it to questions and uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. The first question is about test accuracy. How did the test accuracy issues play into the percentage of asymptomatic carriers? So the testing accuracy is very important. Uh, and, and so what we have done is to look at a, a number of tests uh, available and currently there's uh, over 80 tests uh, that have been EUA or emergency use authorized by FDA and these tests uh, can still vary in terms of accuracy uh, with sensitivity and specificity uh, and uh, the higher the sensitivity uh, obviously uh, the more accurate the test at detecting the virus uh, when you have uh, when you when you conduct testing to begin with and then the specificity that we touched on before um, means that if you have a positive test uh, and you have high specificity um, then you're likely to have confirmed the illness you're looking for versus some other illness from a cross reaction uh, and so we are looking at tests only um, that cross uh, beyond uh, 86 uh, percent sensitivity or higher. Uh, and then specificity um, has been better with the number of tests uh, up to 100 percent specificity. Uh, and that will have a tremendous effect on uh, our ability to make a clinical determination of uh, who's ill, who's not, uh, who may have had the illness before, and, and who has uh, uh, developed some level of immunity, for sure. Okay, the, this question kind of gets to does someone who's asymptomatic become symptomatic? Like, what, what are the, what's the likelihood? But I'll read you the question. When you say asymptomatic, does this mean there are people who pick up the virus but never get sick and can shed? Or the people who pick up the virus and shed just aren't sick yet? So there, uh, there are two categories there and that question gets at both of them. Um, you're either pre-symptomatic, meaning that you've contracted COVID uh, and there's a one to two day period, sometimes three day period, uh, where you haven't developed symptoms yet. And we know that 99% of people, uh, once they contract COVID, do develop symptoms within 14 days. Um, but that pre-symptomatic uh, period, when that one to two day period, you are infectious, you just haven't had symptoms yet. And a, a solid testing regimen can potentially identify those individuals early enough to get them out of the workplace uh, and, and limit and mitigate uh, transmission risk. And then those individuals uh, that contract COVID and never have symptoms are the asymptomatic group uh, that we're referring to um, because uh, their body, for whatever reason, hasn't mounted an immune response to produce um, uh, symptoms, meaning that they still may have uh, IgG and IgM, the immune components, uh, in, in response to the virus, it, um, but the response uh, from an immune standpoint just hasn't caused any symptoms to exist. Uh, we know these, these are the younger populations uh, that have been affected uh, are, are mostly asymptomatic. And regarding the um, study you showed about the woman who was shedding virus, was she shedding it in fecal matter or respiratory droplets? Uh, so she was shedding uh, in both, and she had prolonged shedding in droplets, um, but uh, also uh, a very long prolonged uh, shedding in the fecal matter, and that's what, what was the 63 days that I showed. 
So it was it was well after. So she had eight up uh, 18 days worth of shedding beyond her symptoms. So her symptoms resolved. She shed in the respiratory tract for 18 days. Um, she shed in her fecal matter for 63 days after her symptoms uh, subsided. Okay, we couldn't read all that in that short time you had it on the screen. No, um, in contact tracing, is there evidence to support that verification of wearing masks could change recommendations of risk level and self-quarantine? Uh, at this point, no, there's no clear um, uh, determination that because masks are worn, we can ease off of the, the hallmarks of social distancing, good hand hygiene, and uh, adequate screening, uh, because all of those factors are needed to have a, uh, a combined protective effect that's reasonable to help keep the population safe. Uh, so uh, modulating uh, and easing off of other restrictions because of mask wearing uh, has not been uh, a methodology um, that uh, we've seen identified, in, in, you know, at, to any level of effectiveness. Okay, and a couple of questions regarding states relaxing certain restrictions. Um, are we seeing a resurgence of infections in those areas where restrictions are being relaxed? And a second question is, what advice do you have for business travel by car, train, or plane, or staying at hotels in states that are phasing in reopening? Sure. So to the first part of the question, yes, there has been some resurgence, uh, recrudescence of illness. Um, in terms of incidents uh, in California and parts of Florida uh, where um, uh, doors have reopened. Um, and in regards to travel to these locations or travel period, uh, it, it's always advisable to practice safe social distancing. Uh, airlines in particular, um, where you're in that confined space sitting, uh, I think the uh, airlines now are uh, doing often one, one person per row, right? Uh, and even sitting uh, two seats away uh, from an in, another individual has been a standard used also uh, for making sure there's adequate distancing between uh, passengers. Um, so definitely wearing masks uh, while you're uh, traveling. Uh, if you're traveling in your car and you, uh, you're traveling with individuals who you've been uh, social distancing with, i.e. your family members, um, then you know, it, it's kind of a discretion uh, to use uh, masks in those situations that uh, are, are uh, confined. Same thing for, uh, same question for offices, right? Uh, when people are returning to work, if you're sitting in your office by yourself, we made comments earlier on previous uh, uh, webinars that uh, one should wear a mask if others are coming in and out of the office, uh, your own office, and if you're isolated in that office and no one else is going to utilize that space, uh, then it is permissible to, you know, have the mask be optional. Uh, but as soon as you leave, obviously donning the mask again uh, would, would be mandatory. Okay, we have time for just a couple more. Um, has viral shedding in fecal matter been confirmed to be viable to actually cause the spread of disease? Yes. Uh, it has um, by um, viral culture. Okay, and then here's a question about hydroxychloroquine. It was used in France to treat COVID-19, which resulted in 100% recovery by 48 hours, yet the FDA is only allowing it for emergency use in the United States. Why isn't this being looked at and talked about more among healthcare professionals? Uh, it has been looked at, uh, it has been studied, uh, and yet there, there are not any um, uh, peer-reviewed robust studies to suggest that it should be used across the board without special consideration. So is it being used? The answer is yes. Um, universities are using it in hospitals uh, abroad, um, but there are uh, pros and cons to its use. Uh, it is not a harmless medication uh, in terms of side effects and risk profile. So each case has to be considered in terms of pros and cons and use of the medication. Okay, and just one last quick one about the use of gloves. Do you believe the use of disposable gloves in public settings like grocery stores, airports, commercial buildings can be useful where access to soap and water is not readily available? Uh, yes, in short, yes. If you can, if you do not have access and you uh, to uh, cleaning your hands, which is, you know, 
Uh, obviously, best hy hand hygiene, alcohol above 60%, um, and uh, hand washing 20 seconds at least with soap and water. Um, then wearing gloves with the proper donning and doffing of the uh, gloves uh, would be optional, uh, an option that could provide additional protection. Okay, we're pressed for time today, so we're going to wrap up. For, for those of you who have outstanding questions, we'll be sure to answer them and distribute all the answers by tomorrow. Those will be posted on our website. They're also distributed through the weekly invitation reminder that we sent out. Thank you all for joining us today and be safe. Thank you so much. Take care.